Hello and welcome. You are listening to the Investor Lab, the auditory epicenter for passionate people seeking a life of freedom, choice, and abundance. And if you like property, and if you want to go far, and if you want to go fast, and if you want to build a huge property portfolio that's going to give you all the money that your heart desires so you can live the life of your dreams, but you just can't quite work out how to make that happen, how does the finance work? How the hell are you supposed to continue to keep buying properties over and over and over again? Well, get ready for your head to melt. This conversation is with a property finance expert called Stephen. His name is Stephen McClatchy. He's the managing director and founder of a company called Loans Australia. He's probably the most um, strategic finance broker I have met. He's in very high demand. So, you know, he's a pretty hard guy to get hold of. But in this episode, we kind of talk about all of the different ways to think about how to really accelerate your wealth and how to make sure you don't get stuck, which is just huge, right? Because 94% of property investors get stuck at two properties. And, and it's something like we talked about in the episode, there's a fractional percentage of people ever manage to retire from rental income. Now, the cool thing is, Stephen and I are quite aligned when it comes to property strategy, but obviously he knows a hell of a lot more than me when it comes to finance strategy. And this is what this episode is all about, how to think about your finances to make sure that you can continue to buy over and over again and not get stuck. So if you're interested in building an exponential property portfolio, this is something you can't miss. And if you're anything like me, you're probably going to have your mind blown if you can understand the implications of everything we talk about today. And therefore, I would love for you to share this with someone that you love and care about because this is really life-changing stuff, this episode. If you can understand this, this is the key to freedom in my mind. It's the big rock. If you understand what we do, which is find properties which are high growth and cash flow positive and have the ability to add value, you're on the way. Like this is the exact thing that you need to do. Like buying those types of properties is what is going to give you the maximum return, the greatest liquidity, the freedom, the cash flow, everything you need to live a good life. But understanding how the finance strategy needs to work for you to be able to do that is the critical key to the whole thing. So As I said, if you enjoy this episode, make sure you share it with someone, let somebody else know about it, give me some feedback, tell me what you think. If this changed your strategy, let me know what you reckon. But without any further ado, let's get stuck into it. And I look forward to seeing you on the inside. Hey guys, welcome back to the Investor Lab. Joining me today is Stephen McClatchy. He is the founder and managing director of Loans Australia and is an expert finance, property investment finance strategist and all of this kind of stuff. So I can't wait to dig into all of the, all of the things we're going to be talking about today. Stephen, good to have you on the show. Thanks, Goose. Great to be here. One of my favorite topics, property and finance. So uh, ready to help you out in any way I can. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really excited because I've I've had the benefit of talking to you offline, and I've got to say, some of the conversations that you and I have had have fundamentally transformed the way that I have thought about property and finance. And I'm talking like in in a very short conversation, you know, I, you've managed to shift paradigms for me in what is possible and how to do things. So I'm really excited to try. I, I'll be I'll be honest with you, Stephen. That's part of the reason I got you on the show. I was like, maybe I can capture him for 45 minutes, and maybe I can just share some of this gold with other people. I thought this is this is too good to be cooped up. And I know you're busy with your business, so this is my opportunity to try and extract some of that gold and get it out to the masses. So that's, that's called a smart strategy, Goose. Very important. <laughs> totally, <laughs> it's, all about, totally. it's all about strategy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, mate, um, for people who don't know who you are, um, why don't you give us a little quick overview on who you are, what you do, what's Loans Australia, what are you all about? What's your specialty? Give us a bit of an oversight. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, well, we I call ourselves, well, I call myself a portfolio finance strategist because I really only exclusively work with people who want to build portfolios of, of of mortgages. So I don't actually talk about property so much. I focus on the mortgage part of the transaction. Look, I've been. This is my 25th year in doing it. Uh, so I started off in Sydney a long time ago. I um, actually started in 1995 in finance, pretty much straight away investment finance. So my expertise has always been organising finance for property property groups, uh, large ones. And I so I used to do all the finance for their clients, and that went very well. But I found after a while I didn't want to be connected with one group. So back in a long time ago, now back in 2002. I haven't been connected with any one group. I've gone to the market. Um, 
which has been fun. So you're dealing with much more variety of sort of people. Um, but yeah, that's that's my background. I've got lots of degrees and qualifications. So I, I know if, what I'm doing from that part, and that really helps because when you're talking about building big portfolios, you've got to go beyond just what I call the residential part of the bank. So you got to really have a great understanding of, of companies and trusts and financials, how to pull it apart, where to put things, where not to put things. And certainly having that educational background has helped. Totally. Yeah. So now you, you mentioned just a second ago that you only work with people who want to build big portfolios. Does that mean that you only work with people who already have big portfolios, but now can't work out what to do? Because and the reason I ask that is because I understand it doesn't sound like you work with um, homeowners who want to just go buy their dream home, right? Buy a house. And let, let me, right? oh, so I should explain that. So I've got, I've got 15 staff in my business. So yeah. I've got three other people who do sort of what I do, but at different levels and different experiences. Yeah. So yes, we do do with homeowners, but I, I just personally don't do that myself. Got it. Um, I only deal with people who've got generally two or more properties and want to grow, but we do deal with people who are getting into the market. It's not our, we don't advertise that, but we get most of our business referral. So if someone yeah. refers to our friend, they want a home, no problem, but we don't advertise, we do it. Uh, and we do start with newbies. Um, so if they're starting out with their first investment property, well, they may not get me, but that's fine. Our team, the two people we've just promoted have been with me seven years. Now they've, been, they've had their apprenticeship and on they go. Well, I, I just want to point out for the listeners that you're the only person that I've known that I have to ask your permission to, re, to refer someone to you because you're so in demand, which is obviously a very good thing, which is a very good thing. But yeah, so so yeah, because because my, yeah, my question, my line of thinking was around... Um, like most of the most of our client, well, our, our, when our clients come to us, typically they're somewhere between zero and three, right? So yep. in the earlier stages, but every single one of them, even if they're just starting, wants to build a bigger portfolio. And getting that finance set up at, right at the start and getting that kind of structure and the strategy right is is critical, I think, right? So yeah, let's kind of like start getting into some of the the ins and outs of it. You say you help people who who build you know, they want to build large portfolios and you help people to effectively do that. And we all know that, that that property investing is a game of finance with a few houses thrown in the middle. We've all heard that terminology before. So what is the number one reason that most people get stuck at one or two properties? Because 90, 94% of investors never make it past property number two. What's What in your view is the major reasoning behind that? There's a few because I've looked at that problem and and I've developed actually uh, a strategy to get around that problem. So there's a few reasons. So one is a lot of people still have a, a do-it-yourself mentality, I think. Yeah. Um, so I think it starts, it, personally for me, it starts with mindset and and people are stuck in this, this old Australian adage of I'll have a go, she'll be right, I'll do it myself and for various reasons. And I think that's the first mistake people make uh, that you can't hope to get a better result than what your peers are, what your family has, if you're not going to try something different. You're not going to change the results. So first thing they've got to realise that maybe they need some, they're not the expert in everything. Mm. They might be a generalist, which is fantastic, and they know a bit about property, they know a bit about finance. Like it's not, it doesn't take an Einstein to walk into a bank and ask for a loan. You know, any little Johnny in there will sit down and try and make it into a loan for you. But whether the little Johnny knows how to get it into 10 loans is a different kettle of fish. And little Johnny in the bank is not trained how to show someone to get 10 loans. It's actually the reverse. They, they want to make it less risky instead of more risky from a bank. Mm. Um, so the first thing I would say is you need to have it. You've got to understand that you're going to need a team of experts to make it happen. That's yeah. the first, which is a mindset thing. The next thing is the structure because you could actually be your own hindrance because you go off and buy a property and you haven't actually even thought about the structure of what you're going to own it in because the structure actually affects your borrowing capacity. Um, and people might have heard of buzzwords like companies and trusts and things like that. But there's lots of different types of trusts. And so these trusts have different outcomes in terms of how you can borrow money. And for some people, it might be their fourth or fifth property before it's even worth setting up a trust. Yeah. I'm a big believer in not paying money if you don't have to. But I'm also a big believer in calling it a cost of doing business. And so number one is they've got to get their structure right. Um, a big mistake people make is they focus on the cost, the interest rate. Yeah. And they think that's the most important thing. And I, I still get it. So, Stephen, what's your best rate? I say, well, I'm, I'm accredited with 152 lenders, probably 5,000 products. Wouldn't have the faintest. If you want to ask me how much I can borrow and how many properties I can I can grow, then that's a that's a better very question to ask. Very, yeah, very different question, right? Yeah. And so. People get held back then by first thinking about rate, which is the wrong question to ask, but they don't know any better because 
the whole media, all they do is push down your throat interest rate. And banks, they lead with interest rate, not, not structure, policy, anything else. Yeah. And then the next thing on from that is once they've got the, the sort of structure, the two most critical things is getting a deposit and being able to get the borrow capacity. So that's what I focus on a lot with people. How do we maximise your deposit? And there's a couple of ways of doing that. I don't know if I've got time to. You, mate, you got you got time because I was about to ask you. Like, I mean, I I have ways when I think about property. So, oh, I, hang on that point because I want to come back to that. When I look at because my where I bring the most amount of value to our clients is is thinking about property strategy. Any, I'm like anyone can go. Anyone can go buy a house, right? Anyone can Absolutely. just jump on real estate. I can go buy a house. But I like to try and think about okay, well, where are you going to get stuck next? You know, is it are you going to get stuck? Yeah. Do you have plenty of serviceability but not much capital? Do you have plenty of capital and not much serviceability? Where's the sticky point? And then what what can we do from a property selection and acquisition perspective to maximize deposit potential or serviceability and all that kind of stuff? So, yep. I, you know, there's many ways that I can do that with property. But I'm wondering how you, what's your approach to like maximizing deposits? What's that? Do you want to dig into yeah. that? Yeah, I will. I'm not too harebrained, but I like what you do and I'll weave in exactly the, your strategy because it actually works for people who want to build portfolios. But anyway, so on the on the deposit thing, there's a couple of things they can do. So I have an adage I talk about with my clients is you can't save your way to wealth. Mm. And that's a big mindset shift for a lot of people because they're trained to save before they buy. Um, they're trained to pay a bit extra into their mortgage. They're trying to set up an offset account. They're trying to pay fortnight instead of monthly. Uh, they're trained to when they get their tax check put into the mortgage if you do all those things, good on you, but it is so slow. If you think that's going to make you wealthy and it's going to pay off your home you know, quicker than 25 or 30 years, unfortunately, you're going to be dreaming because maths don't work that way. Maths works on an adage called compound interest, and compound interest is uh, the greatest help to wealth there's ever been. And I think you talk about that in your book as well. Yeah. And it's a critical factor. Once you understand it, it should drive every wealth decision you make. But the biggest part of compound interest is it's based on time. And compound interest has an effect in the first few years, but it has a massive or hyperbolic effect after 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. That's when you're getting an absolutely phenomenal effect. The problem is in Australia, the average length of property ownership for an investment is about seven and a half years. So most people are never going to experience the absolute joys of owning the property because they get rid of it so early. Um, and that, that's a really important point. So what they've got to do to get the deposit is, number one, forget about saving as their main mechanism of building the deposit. What they've got to focus on is two things, I believe. One is maximising actual value of your property you've bought or you've got. And you can do that in a number of ways. Um, like I know you do a lot of add value stuff. So you can add values to the properties. Um, I don't know the last time, if anyone, I'm sure people who are listening to this own property, when was the last time your property manager rang you and said, oh, Steve, I've got a great idea to increase your rent by 20, 20, 10 or 20 bucks a week, or we're going to increase the value. You know, This little thing you can do is going to add $30,000 value. So there you can pull the equity out and go again. You know, I've owned property for about 24 years. I've never, and I've got lots of property, lots of property managers. Not one has rung me up and, and said anything like that. Maybe they've said, oh, I'll do a rent review, but then I get some crappy report I could have clicked on CoreLogic and got myself. Yeah. Um, there's no real value add. So that's about, is about having your team of experts to add, add value, get a lot of valuations on your property. When I do, when I have a client, we do on average six valuations per property security because I want to maximize every last drop of equity out of that property. And the results are astounding. So, okay. So I want to grab onto a couple of points there. So you said that obviously you get a hyperbolic, hyperbolic effect in, cap, in compound growth once you get to the sort of 30, 40, 50 year kind of mark, but everyone typically owns uh, investment properties for around seven years. How do yep. you, and uh, so I want to, I want to touch on that. And, uh, and I also want to touch on, no, let's just hang on that actually, because how do you, we're, like markets move in cycles, okay? So if you buy at the yep. right time in the cycle, let's say you buy at the start of the cycle, um, yep. which is something we're very good at, and you get a lot of growth in the first couple of years, and then that growth starts to plateau, right? Which is which is common. Yep. Yep. So, definitely. It, so at that point, that's when a lot of investors go, okay, well, I've had my growth. Let's take the capital out and go buy something else. Now, in a sense, you're still taking that capital and you're recompounding it multiple, multiple times, but you're just not keeping it in one asset. So have you ever thought about like, like does that measure stack up? Like, is there actually no. to, to a degree a benefit in America, in trading? It does. Right. In America, it does because you don't pay capital gains tax when you sell a property there and you roll it over. 
You just roll it over, go again, no CGT. In Australia, no. I, I don't believe so because every time you buy and sell property, there's a lot of transaction costs. And so every time you do that, you've got to make up the loss. You've just, the, all the in, in costs, all the out costs. And he's, if you're doing what you're doing, you buy one of Dash Dots, you're going to make money. So you're going to have CGT as well. So you're going to make all that money up, which is a massive stymie to compound growth. What I think people should do, this is my way of doing things, is it's very important, the asset that you select. And that's one of the reasons people go wrong because traditionally they've bought these big assets, yeah. which because they're chasing growth, uh, I call those accumulators. Yes, they'll accumulate really well in growth, but they start with those. And that's why people get stopped out at one or two properties because they've got the wrong asset selection. They, they buy an asset which they're not going to get any borrowing capacity benefit from because most of them you're losing money, you're not making money. So yeah. it's actually pulling your borrowing capacity back unless they buy in a trust which will get down get to, down to the track. Yeah. Most people don't initially. So I suggest if people want to smash their borrowing capacity, they buy a lot sort of stuff that you do, which I call accelerators, which are properties which are going to accelerate your growth because they're actually going to bring a positive cash flow to the scene, which is actually going to boost your borrowing capacity. Um, so in the early days when people are building portfolio, I recommend buying properties which are going to boost your borrowing capacity because when it does that, you get two effects. One, it's boosting your borrowing capacity. The second one, you've got more money to pay off your non-deductible debt, whether you've got a home loan or personal loans, credit cards, whatever. You've got all this extra cash flow to pay down the debt, which you know you want to get rid of. Yeah, um, totally. So, so let, let's talk about that for a minute because, like, you know, increasing. Oh, actually, sorry, bef- one second before we go into that. So, we've talked about you actually touched on there just scraping out as much equity as you can. You're wanting to get like six valuations on it or per property and going, okay, when can we take more? When can we take more? So, does yeah. that mean you're constantly looking for the opportunity to continue to scrape leverage? And then the, the follow on from that is how does that affect? Borrowing capacity and future cash flows, because we know we all know that if you buy a property at six percent yield, that's great. And it's going to be cash flow positive, theoretically, depending on your loan structure and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. And that'll produce a net income. And then you go and refinance that and you scrape all the equity out of it. Then you're going to be increasing your debt. That's going to decrease your cash flows. And if you continuously do that over time, you're going to be just pushing that down into a negative position over time. Yep. So how do you, how do you balance that? And okay. I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but I know no, you no, talk. I know you, what you're getting at. You, you talk you talk a lot, so I want to get in a few. So <laughs> All right. So how do you balance that? And then also my follow-up question to that is is specifically how does cash flow positive affect borrowing capacity because banks have got things like uh, risk buffers and you know they only accept a certain amount of um, rent and all of that kind of stuff. So there we go. Over to you. Let's let's Okay. So <clears throat> the, I was mentioning there's a couple of ways to boost your deposit. One is getting the valuations right. Yeah. And as much as you can. The second one is actually smashing your debt. And right. so I'm a I'm I do a lot of things I do as a reverse of what the industry says. So I'm a firm believer in not having everything interest only forever. I'm a believer in continually paying down debt. Um, that's my philosophy. So if you've got a home, what my goal is um, is to smash as much debt as fast as I can because it's not deductible. It's not helping me. It's going to pull down my borrowing capacity. Can I, can I, yeah, I want to jump in there. So yep. do you, is that basically a carte blanche? You just think people should be printing an interest from day one and then pay the surplus into there? Or do you think that there's a time and a place, particularly earlier in the portfolio, where, where interest only for the first five years to keep more available cash on hand is a wise idea? Lovely clarifying question. No, I'm a firm believer in interest only on absolutely every asset. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in interest only on every asset, but... And now I'm going to the secrets of my course. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cover on some of them. But okay. that, that's a key plank of what I talk about. Interest only on absolutely everything, even in your home loan. But you're paying all your excess cash flow into your mortgage. So even though the repayment minimum is interest only, you want to pay absolutely every skerrick you can. And I call it giving every dollar a mission. So you've got all these dollars. You might have 2000 coming in a week. It's up to you how you want to allocate them. Now, a lot of people might allocate it on Netflix, on Stan, or going down the pub and spending 300 bucks. That's up to you. I can't tell you how you're going to allocate it. What I can tell you is the outcome of allocating it like that. But if you can allocate them in a way that's going to build your wealth for the first few years, the amount of money you're going to end up with down the track is phenomenal. So it's up to people. But people aren't educated, so they don't know how to make these decisions. But when they are educated and it twigs that, wow, if I just do things a little bit differently, I'm going to have so much money, it's not funny within a short period of time. And so my thing is have everything interest only, 
plow as much money in, into your mortgage as you can. I have special ways of doing that, which I can't give away all my secret sauce, but I'll give you the big picture stuff. You mentioned you've got a course, so we're gonna. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to let you get away from that one at the end. We'll get back to that. So. No all right. So there's two things then. You've got to drive down debt. So what that's also doing is building a deposit. So we're, what we call, we're doing what we call debt recycling. Yep. We're recycling a non-deductible debt and then pulling it out to turn it into tax deductible wealth building, compound building, hyperbolic return debt. What, what, about, what about if you're rent vesting and you don't own a home? Same thing. So I get that question a lot. I, I was a rent vester for 20 years. Yep. I'm a massive proponent of rent vesting. So what you've got to do there is you do exactly the same thing. Because remember, people get capped out of borrowing. Their issue is they can't borrow any money. Now, there's a big difference between going to some banks or brokers and other brokers, and they'll find you who the better ones will find you a lot more than what the average will, no doubt about it. Uh, we won't get into that right now. But <laughs> what I'm saying is that um, by paying down debt, you're improving your borrowing capacity. By investing in what I call accelerators or properties that are going to give you money, you're yep. boosting borrowing capacity. So you're doing everything possible to improve your position. Uh, especially in the early years. In the early years, you know, you've got to get the structure right. You've got to get the type of asset you're doing right. You've got to, things you can do to your borrowing capacity to improve it as well, which we haven't talked about, but yep. all these sort of things. And I call them the one percenters. They might not be a huge difference on their own, but added together is a massive difference. Totally. So is it the same, like if you've got an interest only loan, and I, 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 don't want, I don't want to get stuck here for too long because there's so many more things I want to cover. But if you've got an interest only loan and you've got an offset on your investment property, is putting it in the offset on the investment property the same as paying down the debt from a, from a servicing perspective? You can. And so that's where the a structural conversation comes in. So if you're yep. a rent fester, I'm yep. still a proponent of interest only, but I'm a proponent of also paying down the debt. You can do it in an offset account. Um, and we have ways of setting up offset accounts. That's okay. Um, for me, it's the second best type of strategy. I prefer actually the mortgage going down, but it depends when the, if the rent vest has ever become an owner-occupier. So I need to know that because there's certain things we need to put in place if that's what they're moving towards. Yeah. Um, but if they're not, if they're going to be a rent vester for a long time, then I'm a massive proponent of them paying down their de- the actual mortgage itself and just recycling that debt back into more. Because it's not about it's not about tax deductions. Um, it's not about you know how much you're getting back from the tax office. It's about your wealth, how yeah. much net wealth you can generate. And that's about borrowing capacity. It's about having a deposit to get into your next property. Um, because leaving your money, I've seen it for 20 years, leaving your money in offset accounts or in redraw, it's very tempting. It's easy to spend. It's easy to. You think all of a sudden you've got forty thousand. I'm rich. I'll go instead of going uh, camping that Christmas. You're going. Oh, you're off to Bali or off to Europe or something. It's very tempting when you see these big wads of money. And so yeah, I like they're, to they're put they're in quite liquid. To, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like to try and minimize people's chance of spending it on other things. Yeah, make, in the early make, years. Early yeah, years. yeah, it makes it makes sense. Yeah, it, it does require a degree of um, a definitely a degree of a degree of discipline because if you're just going to get the yep. the cash flow, particularly in the early phases, and go and spend that on on Chinese dinners and stuff like that, you're not going to get yourself anywhere. All right, no. so so basically, you're saying first step is mindset. Second t- second step, build a team of experts. You got to think about structures. There's loan structures, and then there's then there's like investing structures and so we're going to get into, the, get into that in a minute. You said then the, the biggest thing is you've got to think about how to maximize your deposit. So paying down debt or adding value or buying in the right place, all of these kind of different things to increase yep. your equity position consistently. Yep. Let's get back to that question I had around around how cash flow increases borrowing capacity when you've got all of these things like risk buffers and um, serviceability caps on, on rental income and all of that kind of stuff. Yep. And look, that's not new. Um, especially CBA have had it for ages. So they, you know, a lot of these banks have caps at <clears throat> two way, main ways they do it. One is that they'll, they'll have a yield figure. So let's say 6%. So if your properties are yielding higher than 6% on an individual basis, they won't include any, any further yield on yep. top of that. Um, others uh, cap out at how many properties. You've got too many properties and then you can't even go to them. That's been an issue. Um, and like you said, if you might be paying an interest rate of 2 or 3%, but the banks might calculate it at six or seven, and that changes uh, depending on the policy at the time. So there's all the, there are a lot of things in play to to stymie people's unbridled uh, buying uh, buying uh, ability. And, but the good thing is there's there's not four banks in the market, and that's what people forget, and that's a big mistake people make. That in Australia there's about 442 different lenders in Australia who can lend you money. Now, of those 442, four of them are big banks that hold about 85% of the current market. And so most people still go to a big bank to get a loan. 
and that's um, you know advertising. It's also lazy brokers who left the bank and they've worked at CBA or wherever for 20 yeah. years and they sell that. Um, and then it's also, you know, other people not understanding what other lenders are out there. But, you know, I've got 155 on our panel and we need that because you've got to think about it that if you've got four banks have 85% of the market, you've got another 435 who are fighting for 15% of the market. So they're, they're trying to survive with only a small part of the market. So they've got to come up with different policies, features, interest rates, whatever, to survive. And they're out there. And they have, we've got some perlers that we might use once or twice a year, but we need them because they've got something kooky or quirky that is going to get a client over the line. Is there much credence to this idea that, like, I've, I've heard it quite a few times, that you, you sort of want to start with the first-tier lenders, the big four, and then progress your way down? So you should always start with the big four and then off you, slowly whittle your way down from first-tier to second-tier to third-tier, et cetera. Is that, is that true, like, from a strategy perspective, or is that just – is that a, a, an old wives' tale? Well, um, I tend to believe the second point, it's an old wives' tale. So what, what I say to my clients is don't worry about the name of the bank. Who gives a flying – a Kahuta, who it is. It's all about show me the money. Who is going to give you the money? People get this misconception that, oh, the big banks are safer than others. No, they're not. How, if you read the media, the amount of money the big banks have lost because of their stupidity and, and greed from investing overseas, I don't know how many times NAB invests overseas and lose hundreds of millions and ANZ, and they're doing all, they invest in wealth management, lose a fortune. We've had a Royal Commission, which shows how incompetent yeah. they are. So look, the big banks are by no means brainiacs running those big banks from what I can see. So what I suggest is it's, it's the structure that you want first, not so much the bank, but the number one thing is structure and also the ability to borrow. So I tend to start with the hardest lenders first. And look, by default, some of those are banks because they have the most minimal borrowing capacity. And that's where most people go wrong because they stick with the banks. And if the bank says no, they think it's no. But no, there's heaps of other lenders who actually want to lend to investors. It's just they don't have branches. They don't have advertising. So if you don't have someone to show you them, then you're going to miss out. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, all right. So we've established buy the right properties, pay down your debt, um, add value where you can, make sure the properties are cash flow positive so that you can continue to accelerate shop around different lenders to make sure you're going to get the right option to suit what you need to give you the access to capital because there's 442 different lenders in the country. So keep shopping it around. Let's talk a little bit about structures because I know this is where it gets really interesting because because I know from the, I know uh, quite a few people who have done the right thing. They've got cash flow positive properties, but they're still hitting on their serviceability buffer. They're, they're still they're tapping out and they're going, what's going on here? These properties all produce a net positive income. Right, they're like they're yep. self-servicing all of their debt and all of their costs and all of their liabilities plus surplus, and they've got actual equity in them that I could use, but for some reason I can no longer borrow. So, what actually, once we understand these fundamentals, which we've covered, what actually is the secret to like essentially building a completely exponential portfolio? Where how, how do you just continue to buy and buy and buy? Like, what's the secret to just scaling up? So, a couple of things I just want to address there that. Just because someone tells you you can't borrow doesn't mean you can't borrow. I see it every day of the week. Someone comes to me and says, oh, my broker told me this, my bank told me that. We have a look at it and there's $500,000 on the table that wasn't used. And that's because most people have a very narrow focus. And I must say that the property industry and finance MO is if, if you're good at what you do, you're massively under the pump. And so what I see, people take shortcuts. And so they might only use the average from the industry, you know, looking under the curtain, most brokers only use two to three lenders. And if it doesn't fit those, most of them generally don't go much further afield. And that's getting worse under this new bid system, which I won't get too te- won't get into that. But um, so most people don't really understand how much they can borrow. They Yes, they go to an expert and they, they accept the expert's opinion, but there's people out there who are big brokers, which give shocking advice about what people can afford to borrow because they haven't put the time and effort to work out other policies of other lenders. They might be small lenders. I don't care how small they are. I just care how much money they're going to give me. So don't don't take it as a given that just because someone's told you you can't borrow more money, you can't, because there's so many lenders out there doing different things. But you're heading towards a structure that we use called trust. Um, that was the idea of your question, but that's very true. So one of the benefits of this thing called trust, uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to – go into what sort of trust, it doesn't really matter, but that that terminology. So when you start buying property in a trust, 
one of the downsides that people sort of don't realise is that if you're buying negative geared properties or a cash flow positive that's turned negative with depreciation, <clears throat> you can't move that tax loss against your income to claim it. Um, there's other things you can do, which we'll get into. But what you can do is that as you're building up profit in that trust, so you might have one or two properties that you're now making money and you've got a taxable income in that trust. So there are lenders out there that will then just start to lend to that trust in isolation as an entity because a company and trust are separate legal entities to you as an individual and they can be treated differently. Not all banks do that though, it's a niche sort of thing. So as you start to build up your properties in this structure and now you're making 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, thousand a year, what they can look at doing is just lending on that trust itself, not looking at all the other things outside of the trust. So we've got family homes or other debts or you've got 42 kids, whatever it may be. Um, they don't need to take all that into account because there are different parts of the bank that you can go to. And this is one of the reasons also people get held back is that most people only ever go to the residential part of the bank. And you've got to think the residential part of the bank is a mass market part of the bank. Yeah. Most of it's driven by computers these days. <clears throat> most of the decisions are made offshore in big call centers, you know, where they don't have the expertise of local market or really what's going on. They, they follow a form, they're trained to follow a form, which is fine. But what it doesn't do, it doesn't bring some individuality to it to understand someone's strategy. But there are parts of the bank that do that. So you can go into parts of the bank called business bank, commercial, corporate markets, specialised industries and private bank. So all these parts of the banks actually has someone looking at your file. Lo and behold, there's someone, actually someone doing some work. And so they're looking at your file, trying to piece together whether your strategy makes sense. And by putting in a trust or company structure, you can go to some of these parts of the bank, which is fantastic because then if you've got a business case and it's showing that you've got three or four properties in there, you're making money, you're adding another one to it, which is going to give you more profit, well, that, make, that makes sense and they're going to sign off on that, on that uh, proposal and you can move forward. Um, now, there's a flip side of that, which is pretty cool as well. So if you own properties in a trust, we've also got lenders whereby they won't actually include any of the debt in the trust if the trust is making money. So we can what, do that. What, what, what do you yep. mean? They won't include yep. any of the debt in the trust. Does that mean that just your personal debt is going to be siloed outside and in the trust or does that mean something else? Yes. We, ta we attack at both angles. And I, I've been doing that myself personally. It's fantastic. So you can buy all these properties in trust. Um, it serves itself once you get, depending on what you're buying, but you, you, you promote what I call accelerators, which are great. Yep. So they're making your money anyway. Um, then outside of the trust, and this is what I did for the family home. So, I won't go into in depth what I do, but pretty much everything I own are in trust. And so when I went to go buy the, the big family home, it was beautiful because I didn't have to include any of the millions of debt I've got. I just had to show the home loan, which is in the wife's name anyway for structuring, um, yep. but you know, using some of the income. And that look, the good thing is there's lenders out there that we don't have to include any of those millions of dollars you've built up in, in trust as debt. So you're getting you're getting a double whammy. It's it's beautiful. It's like it's like compound interest on steroids. So okay, so I just want to I just want to unpack this, right? Because this is something I've been thinking about a lot. <laughs> and I and I, I got to say it's, good, it's something that you actually spoke to me on a on a phone call about and it just like I had like a meltdown. I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> it's pretty is... exciting when you can see. It's the so of it. exciting, right? So I want to pick this apart to make sure everyone can understand it, and also to you know expand my level of understanding about it as well. Okay, so let's just let's go back to the start. All right. So you've realized that you can't do it all yourself. You need to find a team. You need to build a team of experts. You understand the importance of structuring. You need to buy the right types of assets that are going to get you to accelerate. So cash flow, growth, all the good stuff. You need to be consistently paying down your debt. And then you start buying in trust. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you might as well just start buying in trust from day one or maybe it's on a personal situation or whatever the case may be. But let's just say, say you're investing in trust. Now, you buy one property in a trust. You buy a second property in the same trust. You buy a third property in the same trust. And this is all. This is me just positing all of this kind of stuff and tell me if any of it's incorrect or in, inaccurate or whatever. But you buy a few properties in a trust and the benefit of putting a few, grouping a few buy and hold type assets in a trust is that they'll have a similar risk profile and also will, will expand the amount of free cash flow within that trust as opposed to having individual properties in individual trusts or as opposed to having a buy and hold and also a development one, which would have a different risk profile in the same trust. You sort of, that's my thinking around it anyway. Yep. You, so you group the same type by type properties in a trust and then you compound the cash flow, which then creates an environment where that trust or company 
becomes a freestanding entity and none of the liability is personally associated with you as the individual. It's a business. It's a business that is making its own profit and therefore it's not attached. You're, you're not having to support that business. Correct. And subsequently, two things happen. One is that you get all of your personal borrowing capacity back. Correct. And two, the business will start to be able to service its own debts and self-perpetuate because if it's producing income and it has equity, it can leverage off its own equity and buy its own assets within, within its own structure. Is that correct? You're all over it. You're all over it. That's right. And look, the secret sauce is that the lenders that allow you to do that aren't the big banks. So the big banks are generally looking at a global position. They're looking at everything. And so they even look at if you've got car loans and, and high purchases and, and overdrafts and credit cards and businesses, a lot of them are even pulling that into your personal serviceability. People make so many mistakes, especially if they're a business owner. Business owners can really be maximised, but when they, because they mainly deal directly with banks, they get creamed. They got no hope really of maximising their position if they go direct to a bank. Uh, but you, you've got it right. You can have the best of both worlds. You can build up your asset base and a trust. And I don't disagree with what you said. And having more what I call, you know, more active maybe development stuff in a different trust, that's fine, uh, because there is a risk when you're doing the development phase, and that you don't want to expose your other properties if that's if that's something. But at the end of the day, the more profit you've got in a trust. It's just like a business. The more profit you have in a business, the more serviceability you have. So you just have to weigh up your own individual situation to work out whether you want to have in separate trusts or not. And some people will say there's more risk. Some people say put one property per trust. That's fine. But if you if you want to build your borrowing capacity, it's not going to help a lot. Yeah. Um, depends. If they're hugely cash flow positive, we just use the income from multiple trusts. And that's okay. If you're the sole director... That's no problem. We can tie in your income anyway. So we can do that as well. Um, there just might be another guarantor on the lending because uh, there's another entity of cash flow that you, you're trying to pull in. Yeah. So to, um, a certain, to a certain degree, there'd be a benefit probably, probably depending on your risk profile, probably in grouping a few of them together. I want to ask, yep. you, I ask you something else. Grouping, grouping properties or like at what stage do you become a professional, inv- a, a professional investor, so to speak, and it gets at four properties. And what does that change about <laughs> your ability to continue to borrow? You've got a good memory. So. I do. I, it was it was very impactful. It was very impactful. Yeah. So one, one of the th- products that uh, you're mentioning is that I've I've turned a commercial product sort of into a residential product. And so what it is it's out of a business bank. Um, this thing, and they have business banks have some cool products. Some very cool products, I must say. Um, one of them is a product called I'll call it a lease stock, where basically they just approve the loan based on the rental return of the property, which is really cool. They don't take into account any other debt. They don't take into account personal circumstances. So again, if you've got you know five cats and three kids, none of that really, they don't care. Is it, when they go to the commercial and business part of the bank, it's a whole different metrics about working out how much you can borrow compared to the mass market resi, where there's so much regulation from the government that it makes it a little bit hard compared to 15, 20 years ago when it was all uh, easy peasy. Yeah. But in this, in this, part there there's some there's some cool things so with this lease sort of situation or rental situation that um you need to have you need to be a commercial aspect so they've agreed that if we bought four residential properties into this space they would consider you a professional investor and so this is really good for mature portfolio so you've had a portfolio for a while you've built up your equity but you can't get any borrowing capacity so we can go to this sort of product they need to take four properties into their midst um, and then they'll give you a loan based on the rent return of that portfolio, um, which is really good. Does that does that mean you're going to cross securitize those four assets so they become one unit block? Look, at the end, even if it, yes, essentially, yes. Because even if you're with one, and this is where people make the mistake, that they have all their lending with one bank, even on the individual mortgage, if it doesn't say there's four securities tying it in, because they've got the lot, the bank can do whatever they want. There's so many clauses they have in their loan agreements that whatever you've got with the bank is open season. So if you're behind on a mortgage and you've got 100 grand in your offset account, they can go in your offset account and pull out the 30,000 you're overdrawn in your business account. People don't realise that until it happens to them. They say, holy smoke, where's that 20 grand or 30,000 gone? Then they soon work out what's happened. Um, So that's why I'm a big proponent of having your business banking in different banks and your assets, have your assets separate, have your business with one bank. Okay. uh, So they can't get their little mitts in your money. Okay, now uh-huh. let's say you combine those two strategies, right? Mm-hmm. 
if you have uh, like a group of four or more properties inside one trust, can you then get basically that? Can you then apply that kind of lease doc type yep. products and strategy so that then they would essentially be be lending on one hundred percent of their their income? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, no problem whatsoever. They prefer it to be in a company and trust structure anyway. Um, so absolutely no problem doing that at all. You can pull the cash out. You can do whatever you want with the cash. They don't care. Um, but I'll take it to another level. So that that product's fantastic. So you can do it on commercial and you can do it on residential with four or more properties is what I've got the, the sign off on. Then there's another other cool stuff you can do in business banking. Obviously, besides putting all the trusts there and lots of things, good policies there. But yep. there's other policies I have as well, which are cool for investors. So we had a, we had a client, an IT guy, um, self-employed, had five or six properties, wanted to keep going. And so I took him to business bank and we moved uh, one property to business bank because we had a, a policy there where we can actually lend 100% LVR against a property for business purposes. So he was already at about 78% or something. Um, so we went to business banking. We leveraged up to 100% of the value of the property. He pulled out the cash. And then when he used that to go up as a deposit on another property. And it was a pretty good deal at the time. It was about 3.5% interest rate, interest only. Um, there was no mortgage insurance, no risk fees. There's just a 1% fee to the bank. So that was a cool little strategy, but that's not in residential. Mm-hmm. And most brokers, and yeah, they're only in residential. They understand all these other cool stuff that's out there. So certainly if you're in business, if you've got your own business, there's, there's really lots of things you can do. But then if you're not in business and you're an employee, then you can still make the benefit of having companies and trust structures as you move forward. Tony, am I missing anything here? Because it seems like this is the this is the missing piece. This is the key that unlocks the ability to be able to for people to be able to go, you know, very much faster for a start, and also build a much bigger portfolio, and subsequently get much more cash flow, and ultimately achieve, you know, whatever what everyone wants, right? Freedom, choice, abundance, all that kind of stuff. The ability to work to live their life by choice and do all that kind of stuff. Most people want to do that through investing in real estate, cash flow positive, create a passive income. This seem is this is this? Am I missing anything? Like, is this it? Well, look, um, the government doesn't give us much. That's how I sort of look at it. So you've got to take what you can get. And certainly this is a nice little structure. They have tightened it up a bit, but look, trusts have been around a long time. And if the problem is people don't have mentors, they're not surrounded by people who've got 20 properties. If they were, they'd know about this a long time ago. And that's why they need a team of experts. They've got to get out of themselves and think they know everything just because the media is telling them stuff. And they've got to surround themselves with people who've been doing it or have got it uh, and show them the way because everyone I know who's got a portfolio, and that's anywhere more than sort of four properties, generally has trust um, to help them move forward. And not I haven't even talked about asset protection. Yeah, that's fine, asset protection. I, but I talk, I've got experts in asset protection and estate planning that I use. I've got, I've got experts in trust who write the trust in a way to – because one of the big things with trust also is land tax. So a lot yeah. of people don't know their numbers. I've found over the years, people ha- have no idea about their real numbers on property. When they buy a property, they don't understand the difference. in Because you asked me at the beginning about being tapped out in growth. So I'm a yeah. massive proponent of owning properties in, in all as many states as you can. So yeah. you can ride the capital growth wave as it changes throughout. But you've got to consider land tax. So land tax is very different, whether it's in your own name or in a, a trust structure. In some states, they increase the land tax 50% if you own it in a trust. And so you need a you need to make sure that trust is set up in an expert way by someone who really understands trust, or you're you could be smashed over the head with this extra tax bill you're not aware of because most accountants don't understand it. So they buy these trusts off the shelf from other other law firms and they're not explain the technicalities of how the trust works. They just buy the trust off the shelf, give it to the client, and there you go. Unless the accountant is a, a property expert. So again, on your team, you should really have a, a, if you're going to be serious, is have a lawyer or access to someone who understands how to write your trust to help get around some of the land tax issues, all sorts of things, estate planning, succession planning. So when you're building your big portfolio, what's the exit strategy? How are you going to pass it on to the next generation? Because you shouldn't sell. You know, <laughs> selling is the worst thing you could do because the amount of tax you pay when you made all this money. 
Well, t- t- totally. Uh, mo- a, a lot of the time, the pe- a lot of the time, people sell because they hit a hit a block. You know, they go, oh, "I've got three, maybe now, and oh, I'm going to have to sell one down so I can buy buy another one." And they they never yeah. really perpetuate past it. So, all right, I, I want to ask, I want to ask a couple of, I want to kind of steer this in a little bit of a different direction because I want to ask a little bit about about you. I mean, you've obviously got a, pa- a passion for this, but what's why is it that you're so different in this? Why is it that you've worked a lot of this stuff? And maybe you're not the only one who's worked it out. I'm not. not maybe you have. I, I'm not sure. But like, the, why is it? Some that, of this stuff I have. I don't hear. Well, I I don't hear it right. Yeah. And so this is why I wanted to get you on the podcast. Um, but what what's what drives you? Like, what's what are you trying to achieve out of this? I just I like educating people, and I like seeing people improve their position. Um, you know, I've done pretty well out of it all. And yep. I was taught well. My parents were good teachers and I've had some good mentors throughout uh, my life and teaching me things. And I, that's what I like doing is helping people improve their position. Um, that That's where I get a kick out of seeing people move. Well, first thing I want to see people is pay off their home in under 10 years. And that's what my course is about. Um, yep. And the second thing is exactly what you talk about is, is building, I call it a critical mass of asset over your life that it's going to derive an income so you can live a phenomenal life in retirement. Not, you know, 50% of people at the moment who are retired live on the pension, which is 30,000 a year for the family. And that's dreadful. That, that's a sh- if you're in a decent job and you're earning 60, 70, 80,000 a year, surely you want to at least have that same amount of income when you retire. Because then you've got a whole day, you've got probably kids and grandkids who need help. And now you've got probably 20 or 30 years to live to actually enjoy life because you've been stressed out for 30 years building building your business or your family or your PAYG or your kids or getting in through school, all these sort of things. So now's the time to enjoy it. But most people, and I've looked at it, the stats are terrible and they don't get the property right. Because if you look at the stats at the ABS, of all the people retired, the 3.9 million people retired, only 1.17 have rental income as their main income source in retirement next to no one Wow! And because people sell. They don't understand property and they buy the wrong sort of properties and they can't sustain it. Like you've said, they end up selling because property doesn't work. I can't move forward. But when they say I can't move forward, they don't understand that what it's telling me, they have no understanding of wealth at all Yeah. because wealth is about compound interest. Now, okay. If they think they bought a property, which is going to perform at eight or 9% per annum forever, why on the earth would you ever sell that? If they've bought an absolute dog in the middle of nowhere, which grows at 2% and the cash flow is four, well, maybe you sell that. But if you've bought something that grows at 2% per annum, but it's giving you 6% or 7 or 8 or 9% net, that's not a bad result. Yeah. Especially if it doesn't cost you much to maintain. Um, yeah, t- and as long as it doesn't hold you back, right? Like that could, if you, you know, that can still be a net benefit over a very long period of time if it doesn't huge. hold you back. Okay. Net benefit. Well, what what do you want to be remembered for then? What's the legacy you want to leave? Oh, that's a pretty big call. But look, I just want to help people. Uh, I, I like employing people too. So you're contributing to society by <clears throat> putting, uh, getting people uh, out there helping others. And so that's what I like doing. Um, so I, I like coaching people and helping people to grow and be better. And, and look, at the end of the day, um, you know, well, they say 50% of people get divorced. And yeah. a lot of that's all about money. Uh, because there's stresses in the family. And so I'd like, you know, if I could help improve a bit of people's peace of mind in their family that they do, they can pay their home off because, you know, America's the same as us. 35% of people now at retirement have a mortgage shield in their home and it's yeah. getting worse. There's, there's more and more people moving into a rental society, less people owning their own home. Like, my parents, I remember telling me that when they got their first mortgage in about 1971, it was a 10 year loan. And then, because wages didn't go up as fast and properties did, it went then loan terms went to 15 years. They skipped 20, went straight to 25. Then mm. they went to 30 year home loans. Then they went to 40 year home loans. We've got a 35er as well, but we've got a number of lenders now with 40 year home loans. So wow. just imagine you sa- somehow you save a deposit. They are making a bit better with us, a few first home buyer rules now, but you save your deposit, you get into your home at you know, maybe 30, you're going to be 70 by the time you potentially pay it off. And that's, that's only, for a lot of people, that's a good best case because every few years, people are generally refinancing, paying off all their personal credit cards and personal loans, and they reset the loan term again. And it's this continual cycle of per- personal non-performing debt that they can't get out of. And that's a lot of people. And it's just this perpetual cycle. So my, my uh, good question, my real purpose is to get my program out there, which, which 
turns all that on its head. Is this because the course any, you're talking about? Yeah. Anyone, anyone can pay their home loan off in under 10 years if they make the right decisions. Anyone can do it. And it's actually driven by the style of property that I'm not just plugging you, but it's driven exactly by what you talk about. By getting, you need to leverage. You can't save your way to wealth. You can't save and pay your home loan off. You've got to use other people's money and leverage and then put all that extra cash flow into paying off your home and be disciplined about it as well. That's the only way you can smash your mortgage in, in a short amount of time. And it's mathematically. I want, to, I want to ask about the course in a second. I'm mindful of time. I want to ask you something else just quickly. In the spectrum of things, what's more important? In the, in the spectrum of being able to continue to build your wealth over time, keep serviceability up, continue to buy more properties, get that critical mass, do all that kind of stuff. What's more important, cash flow or growth? I understand that growth ultimately will give you way more wealth, but at the same time, yep. if you hit a barrier and you, like... If you had a choice between getting a property with a 6% yield and a 9% yield and one got, I don't know, 6%, one was 6% yield and 6% growth and one was 9% yep. yield and 4% growth, what would the choice be? That's an awesome question and I love it. So what my formula is, is accelerators plus accumulators plus lifestylers plus risk management equals an unbelievable life. And what I mean by that is you start with your accelerators, which are cash flow positive. You need to build a base. If you start with your growth properties, you're going to have a whole heap of grief because you're not going to – and that's, what I, I, that's how I came up with what I did because I only bought high-growth, negative-geared properties for a lot of years, and it caused me grief. I had thou- tens of thousands, more than that, coming out of my pocket every year in negative gearing when the interest rates were 8%. It was a killer diller. And so uh, that's why I decided to go off and start buying in America, and I bought heavily over there, and it turned out really, really well. Uh, and that was to offset my negative gearing in Australia. Mm. And then I took that concept into what I'm doing now. But yes, yeah, so I, you need your, your cash flow positive properties to build a firm base. So you're not relying on your way because things can go wrong. Once you've got the firm base, you can afford to buy your growth property because it, it's going to cost you, let's say, 10000 a year to keep it. You've got that money already because you've got this base of cash flow positives to afford because you do need the growth to get to the critical mass of assets. But then once you've got your, this is my belief anyway, once you've got your cash flow positives, you, you get a one or two growth, you don't even need any more than that, then I would transition to what I call lifestylers, which are properties which are giving you extreme income. Yeah. So these are high end, and you've talked about, I think, as well. Like For me, that's things like, you know, rooming houses, commercial. Yeah, yeah, it's um, what we call legacy NDIS. phase. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's any of those that yeah. have probably got commercial lending, huge amounts of cash flow, probably a little bit harder to leverage, a bit more complex, but ultimately yeah. total income replacement. Type yeah, stuff. like I'm doing one for a client, a childcare centre. Yeah. You know, you're getting 390,000 a year net income from the childcare centre. You know, what's, fan- the cost on, what's the cost on that roughly? 5.5 mil. <laughs> yeah, but net cash flow, the way we've structured it, from day one, he's going to have $21,000 per month net cash flow. Sounds rough. Net. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Well, he's a doctor. That's <laughs> how <laughs> so he got money. <laughs> but look, there are things you get to at the end, but you need to set your base. Yeah. You can't start at the cream if you haven't got a foundation set up. You need that, that base to get you moving. Yeah, that's totally. and, you, and that's exactly yeah, what. That's and that's exactly what. That's I believe. One hundred percent, I agree wholeheartedly. And we work through those three different phases as well. I'm mindful of time, and I want to get to the course because I want to know about your course, and I want, I want if if is this available to the public? Have you got a link for it? Like, can we put a link in the show notes? You mentioned yeah. about paying off your loan in ten years. Yeah. So um, at the moment, yeah, we've run two courses. Uh, we've had about sixty people. 50, I think fifty-eight people go through the first two courses as like a beta nice. test. Um, so that was just some of our, our clients, and that was extremely successful. So we are about to launch it to the public. So it's not open to the public at the moment. So it's called the Mortgage Freedom Academy. And so they will, we will have a, a website, and we've got lots of videos. We've videoed most, most students going through. So they, it's very hard to explain because it's a six-week course. With so coaching? With coaching or just like? Well, yes. it's Q, So it's a each week it's a, a course course. Let's say it's like a, an hour and a half to two, two hours. Yep. And then there's a Q&A phase each week as well to talk about the strategies and actually how we implement things. And, and some of the things in the course, like I've talked about today, people haven't heard about or they don't really understand. So if people really understood compound interest, they wouldn't sell stuff. Um, and I, I just don't think because they really understand it. Oh, that's one part of it anyway. So that yep. it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty intense course. There's lots of information 
over that six week period. But then the idea of it, at the end of the six weeks, they've got their game plan. So each week there's action items or like homework they do. So a little bit each week that ends up in a game plan at the end of the six weeks. So they can actually implement this themselves because I don't have enough capability to coach people one-on-one. I just don't. And that's why I've done the course. Okay. I'm just, I don't have any time. Um, so the idea is that I put what I've done over 25 years and what's worked very well for me and worked well for some of my clients. Yeah, share the knowledge. Yeah. And I actually do share what I've done personally in the course. I have never done that before. I've never talked to people about what I do because I'm, that's just not what I do. And I don't believe in self-promotion because I'm not a property guy. I'm a finance guy. I talk yeah. about what I do in finance, but not what I've done in property. But in the course, I do tell people what I'm doing now, what I have done, mistakes I've made, all sorts of things. I don't have any issues about doing that because they're, they're, that's what they're sort of buying. So it's not just about paying your home off in nine years. It's then about how do we build this critical mass of assets? And, and I take them through the real number because I'm a numbers guy. So I take them through that with this software I've got to show them so, how it works. So it sounds like it's sort of not just, it's not just a, hey, how do you pay your home down, right? Because it's like, okay, if you've got a home, pay your home down. Cool, cool. There's probably a cool strategy for that. But it sounds like it incorporates overarching finance strategy, including how to think about investment and stuff. Is yeah, I right? love it. It's, it's unbelievable. All right, uh, cool. I'll, it's I'll, very I'll hard want... to describe what it is, but um, everyone who's gone through it, it, it when you see the, the videos of me interviewing people, then it, it, it then you'll get the the gist of it. But this it's very different. Investors. There's nothing like it on the market. What's at all ever? And this benefits investors, not just homeowners, right? Rent investors, and yeah, you know, I'm well. You have to have a property to do the course. I won't let anyone do it if they don't already own one, at least one property. You have to own a property. Yeah. It's not for pe- It is not for people who just want to learn stuff. It's only for people who want to take action. Um, okay, got it. And if that, if we give people the link to the Loans Australia website, is that going to when that, when's that, the course going fine. live? How do we how are we going to get them there? Yeah. I want everyone to get this. <laughs> so do we. We want to do it right, though. Um, yeah. So in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a link. So I can give you the link once it's live um, yep. to the course, and then they can they can do it. Um, yep. We but can I, update the show notes when that comes out. Yep. Yeah, that would be fine. Happy to do that. But look, I'm, I'm really bullish on that, and that's what my passion is when you asked about that, is to get knowledge out there so people can get the right formats, can get the right structure, build their team. Like if people aren't using a buyer's advocate, They've got to be absolute mentals. Um, yeah. uh, I shouldn't say that, but because you can't, if you, the difference between a 5% growth and a 6% growth over 10 years on an average property is about 400,000 in capital growth, yep. just 1% difference in growth. So if you think you can do it better than an expert, you're mad for, for a small fee. Yes, you've got to have the money to do it. Fine, save it a little bit more, but it's going to give you much more money. And that's only over 10 years. And it, it just compounds and compounds the longer you do it. So, Tony, but there's, a, big, there's big, other ways to think about right. that too because even from like the, the cost of using a professional like a like like a buyer's agent or whatever, that's, you know, there's ways to offset that using trust and stuff like that as well from a tax perspective too. So there's, Yeah, look, in claim deductions, all that sort of stuff, but I'm, I'm just saying that people will get an overall better result if yeah. they find an expert in what they do. Yes, every, if an expert doesn't charge, I don't think they're an expert. No. <laughs> no, I agree. That's how I sort of look at it. Um, I agree with you. But that, you know, that's what I would sort of – like you said, anyone can go get a loan, anyone can buy a property, but whether it's going to perform is another thing. Um, but, yeah, so I'm, I'm really – this is exciting for me doing doing my course, um, definitely. Well, I'm, I'm very excited. I can't I, – I, as soon as – once it's actually public, I'm going to personally go and do it myself. I'm, <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to share that with people too. Stephen, I've loved this conversation. I enjoy every time we get to connect and every time we get to chat. I, I always absorb and, and learn something new. So thanks. I'm, I'm confident that this is going to be a bit of a game changer for a lot of people. We'll put a link to the show notes. Um, as you said, you're quite busy though. So – um, I might, you know, but if people want to reach out to you, they can reach out to you directly from there. Is there anything yep. you want to say to people before we wrap it up? Property is phenomenal. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, even if you end up buying just a couple of little cashies and one accumulator and you don't sell, you're going to have a phenomenal life. You'll be way better off than what you would have been. And look, just, just read and listen to the things like this and then reach out to people. Yes, personally, I'm super busy. I am. But I've got a team. I've got 14 staff. And we'll, we'll fit you in. But but don't think – we're not like McDonald's. You can't go to McDonald's, order, zip around the corner, and out pops some food. Yeah, okay, it's food, but it's not a la carte. We're the yeah. same thing. When you come to us, don't expect a week later you're going to get a 20-page strategy report that's going to be the, the dream. It takes time. So you've got to plan ahead. Give it months to get your strategy right, get your team right, and then you'll roll. Don't, that's, that's all I'll say, you know, plan ahead, 
treat it like a business and then you'll uh, reap phenomenal rewards. Awesome. Thanks for that, mate. I appreciate that. And guys, if you have enjoyed this, let us know. Um, send us a comment. Send us a like. Let us know by email if you've enjoyed this. Obviously, if you want to reach out to Stephen, there'll be links in the show notes. If you want to reach out to me, there'll be links in the show notes. And I look forward, as ever, to seeing you on the next episode.